Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Now we come to Romans. Let's go there if you would please. Chapter number 8. And we're going to read uh, beginning at verse 35. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 and we'll read through 39. The end of this great 8th chapter. It's a much discussed and taught and preached portion of the New Testament. But it never ceases to be old. It's the inspired Word of God. And not only that, these are powerful words of encouragement to the church. Amen. You know, uh, you need to be encouraged once in a while. Now, you would just think that receiving encouragement is an easy thing. It's an automatic thing, but it's not. Now, let me give you an example. Sometimes when you're, if you're married, you married folks will understand this. When you're married and your wife tries to help you and encourage you, you don't always receive that just like that. Sometimes you resent it. Now, I, I thought you folks were living, breathing people, but I'm starting to think I'm in Tombstone, Arizona at the moment. You don't always receive it. And there's something about we human beings, sometimes we resist even encouragement. We, we have a resentment. It's, it, it's as if it's a, it's a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness to say, Lord, I need to be encouraged. King David encouraged himself in the Lord. So we're going to pray that God will help us to be encouraged through this word. Now let's get it. Verse number 35. Who shall, let's read together, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other such thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may be seated. I don't know too much about the future, and most of the people that I've met that think that they're experts on the future, uh, I find out that they didn't know much about the future either. And if you get into the business of trying to predict the future, you're probably going to end up with egg on your face. You're going to be embarrassed. Of course, some people can predict the future, and then when something totally opposite happens, they just make a new prediction. And you know, some people are in the business of predicting, and they get a reputation for being experts not because they are accurate in their predictions, but just because they're making predictions. Some people get a reputation for being smart just because they're making predictions and nobody ever checks up on them. And uh, it's the classic, uh, the classic thing, you know, sometimes the bigger lie you tell, the more people believe it. So the future is a very, uh, a very precarious situation, and it is not easy for us to know very much about the future. Now, we do run across people who make predictions, and I mentioned to the young people the other night that uh, Leonardo da Vinci made tremendous uh, calculations. He was a great, not only a great artist, but a great, uh, of course, scientist of sorts, and we all of us enjoy seeing the wonderful Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. What, what a tremendous human being. Some people believe he was the smartest man perhaps that ever lived. 
in modern times, so-called modern times. He was born in the 1500s. And way back in those days, he predicted things like helicopters and and uh, uh, he predicted things like scuba diving, how people could uh, uh, get uh, through pressurized air, perhaps could go underwater and stay for long periods of time. He even fathomed airplanes and not just talked about it, but he literally made drawings. And these drawings, although they had to be tweaked, obviously, a great deal, were pretty close in terms of the aerodynamics and other such things, were pretty close to reality. It's an amazing thing. And you figure he lived in 1500, he was born in 1400 and something, lived up to uh, the middle 1500s, about 1550 something, he died, I think. But imagine a man, hundreds of years before some of these things took place, he actually made the prediction. That's pretty astounding. But for the most part, people don't do very good predicting the future. But I know something. I know something about the future. And I'm so confident. I'm so bold. I'm so, I feel like Leonardo da Vinci. I know about the future. And I'm not afraid. I feel prophetic. I feel absolutely confident. I don't have any hesitation to talk to you about the future. I'm not even worried about what you think about it. It's, I'm going to go for the big prediction. I'm going to go for the big deal. I'm going to get absolutely radical. I'm going to get in your face bold. I'm going to put it on the line. I'm going to give you a blank check on the future. If what I say... Sister Mooney, write a check for a million dollars right now. Write a check for a million dollars right now. Get your che- real check, but get the real deal out. Write a check. I don't know. How many zeros is that? A million dollars. Oh, there it is right here. A million dollars. Thank you very much. What a church. You don't even have to write your check right now. One million dollars. United States right here. I didn't know you were that rich. Million dollars. I I am so bold in what I'm going to predict tonight that I think I will title this sermon a million dollar guarantee. You don't have to go to Las Vegas. All you got to do is prove me wrong. And I will give you this million dollars right here. All right, that's a little facetious. I can't write a check for a million dollars. I'm going to be honest with you. Sister, poor Sister Mooney didn't even know how many zeros to put into a million dollars. But I could confidently write a check for a million dollars. I used to love listening to old, uh, uh, I say old affectionately, but Bishop S.C. Johnson, who used to, who deposited, this is a true story, some of you people that <laughs> are old enough to remember this, he was an apostolic preacher. And he put, he deposited, he was very, very wealthy, made a lot of money uh, in the trucking business. He took, uh, he had a whole fleet of trucks that would go down to Florida and pick up fruit and bring it back to New York City. And Bishop S.C. Johnson in Philadelphia, he had a church, of course, in Philadelphia, very radical. He didn't believe in drinking Pepsi-Cola, he didn't believe in... Uh, he didn't believe in eating ice cream. He was very, very... I'm not sure some of you would have made it. I'm not sure I would have made it in his church. He was... But, but he had quite a congregation. Thousands of people. And Bishop S.C. Johnson, he had every week on the radio, he had a worldwide radio network. And he had... He wrote a check and he deposited it in the bank and he put it together with lawyers and attorneys and everything. I mean, this was the real deal. And he would taunt. I wish we had some old-time apostolic preachers. I have to tell you. He would get on the radio and say, I've got a million dollars deposited in such and such a bank in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A million dollars. And I will write you a cashier's check. If you can find anywhere in the Bible where anybody was baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he would say, come on, you Baptists. Come get your million dollars. Come on, you. And he would talk. He said, it's a million dollars. And he was a multi-millionaire many times over. At one time, he was one of the wealthiest men along the eastern seaboard. And he was an apostolic preacher, Bishop S.C. Johnson. It's a fascinating. He was a fascinating individual. Radical, but fascinating. 
And he would taunt these people. He would say, come collect your money. I got the money. And he would, he would uh, demand for them to uh, step up. Come and debate me. Come and show me the scripture. And he'd say, I'm going to be in North Carolina on Saturday night. Come get your million dollars. And then he would get on the radio the next week and say, I was in North Carolina. Had a million dollar check ready. But nobody came to collect it. He said, you know why they didn't come to collect it? Because there's nowhere in the Bible where anybody was ever baptized any other way except in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't you just love that kind of preaching? So I'm going to make an offer today. I'm going to say that I don't know how much money. Maybe can I sell a thousand dollars? I'll give you my band. It's about the only thing I've got that's absolutely free and clear. Got a free title. I will give you my van if you can prove this prophecy. Now, you don't get very many prophecy preachers like this, do you? When was the last time you heard a prophecy preacher say, So-and-so is the Antichrist. And if I'm proven wrong, I will give you my van. When was the last time you heard anybody say that? I will give you my van if you can prove what... I don't know much about the future, but this one thing I know, one thing I am absolutely confident of, that nothing shall ever happen to God's people, that no demon, no devil, no circumstance can ever take you out of the hand of God. If you want to make it, you can make it. If you want to be saved, you can make it. Nothing, 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 nothing can separate you from the love of God. Tap your hands, church. Nothing, 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 nothing can ever stop this church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against this church. The devil's not big enough to stop this church. There is no enemy big enough to stop this church. There's no government agency. There's no bomb big enough. There's no power big enough. There's nothing in this world. No kind of energy, no kind of philosophy, no kind of idea that can overcome the power of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. And that's what I stake my life on. That's what I declare to you. And yes, I'm passionate about it. Yes, I believe it with all of my heart. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, makes a similar statement. Let's go back and read it again. Brother Anderson, we're in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Let's just read it again. Romans 8, 35. Right where we started. Who shall separate? Who? Here's the question. Who shall separate? That's... A verb. It means who can pull us away from Jesus Christ? Who can do it? And he's asking, of course, a rhetorical question, but he goes ahead and deals with the answer. Go ahead. Who shall Read. separate us, who from, shall the separate us from the love of Christ? Now watch. Shall tribute. Here's something we have to deal with here. Uh, let's go to that little verse of Scripture. And we're going to come back to that. Don't panic. But go over to uh, Romans. I think I gave you a verse of Scripture somewhere, didn't I? In Hebrews. Go to Hebrews. Now, what we're going to deal with here tonight is who shall separate us from the love of Christ. We could put this another way. If Christ loves us and Christ desires to save us, and by the way, Jesus does love us, I'm not going to get fancy on you tonight. I'm just going to tell you, Jesus does love us. How many know God loves you? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever... Oh, I do wish we had some Holy Ghost people in the house. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not... Yeah. <laughs> shall not... Perish. You get on alcohol, you can perish. Get on drugs, you can perish. Just put money in your pocket, you will perish. 
People will rob you of your money. They'll steal everything that you've got. But if you put your life in the hands of Jesus, you shall not perish. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Shall not perish. Now, I don't want you to get confused here. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. In other words, if God wants you saved, you're going to be saved. So if you could figure out how to get in this very, shall we say, this very awesome aristocracy. I like to think of it, I like to think of Holy Ghost living as a spiritual aristocracy. If you could get in this spiritual aristocracy, the Bible refers to it as a body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And you can be sure that God is not going to let anything happen to His body. We're His body. We're His people. We belong to Him. We've been bought by His blood. And nothing shall take us out. But you say, well, how do you get that? Well, there's much... uh, Much that we could say about it. But look here in Hebrews chapter 11, and you can best understand it. And verse number 16. But now they desire a better country. Now, the Apostle Paul is trying to show us here how that not only ancient people, but New Testament people managed to come into a relationship. Now, I'm going to simplify something much more complicated than what I'm talking about, but I'm just going to simplify it here. Paul said... The way to get into this relationship with God is, is we're going to come to this interesting little word here. The people, the ancient people of God, these wonderful heroes of the faith that the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is dealing with here. And assuming that the Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews, we're not, Hebrews, we're not really sure. But we do know this, that what those people had was a desire. I wish there was somebody here that wanted to be saved. Because if you want to be saved, if you want to be saved, if you desire to be saved, something is going to happen. This may surprise you. You know, uh, you may think, well, getting in the church, being saved, being filled with the Holy Ghost, becoming part of the church. Sometimes people come in here, they think, oh, it's so hard to get into Calvary Tabernacle. Let me tell you something. Some of you are newcomers here. I know some of these Calvary folks, they look, Uh, Some of them especially really work hard at trying to look sophisticated. But don't you be fooled by them. I want to tell you, they're just a bunch of creeps. Ain't nobody going to help me now. Most of the folks in this church were just a bunch of creep, drunk, sinners, bar rats. There's people in this church that used to be tabletop bar dancers. That's a ratty group of people. Isn't it? They're in this church. Drunks are in this church. We've got people in this church that have been in prison. And for some, it hadn't been too long ago. We've had people on this platform that were ex convicts. How would somebody help me preach? I mean. I know we got people in here, you know, that come in and you see all these people coming in, in these nice cars, Cadillacs, and people got on good suits, and you think, my, I could never belong to this church. But let me tell you, there was just a bunch of regular, ordinary people. Some of them were living horrible lives, but they came to church. God filled them with the Holy Ghost. They got off the drugs. They got, oh, somebody help me now. They got off the drugs. They got off the alcohol. They turned their life around. God gave them a new life. God gave them a new heart. God gave them a new spirit. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. Can I get a witness? I know some of you folks don't want to say much right now because I'm too close to where you used to live. We got people, we got men in this church that when they first came here, they looked like women. Had hair down their back. By the way, you know, I've been praying a prayer lately. I'm going to get back on my sermon. I just want to meddle a little bit for a while. I've been praying, God, give us some men. Give us men with men's voices. I get so hungry just to hear a male voice. I, I pray that God, 
I hope God goes out there by His Spirit tonight. Somewhere out there in some dive or bar, there's got to be a man that sounds like a man. God save me a baritone. I'm just hungry to hear somebody say, To God be the glory. Let's kind of shake the place. Can I get a little witness on that? I pray for you men that God will give you voices like a man. Give you the spirit of a man. Give you the strength of a man. Give you the anointing of a man. Oh, I feel the Lord in this place. Come on, church. Come on, church. We have people in this church that once did things that I could not mention. But you see, that was then, this is now. So don't say you can't get in this church. All you've got to do is just say, I want to be saved. By the way, this is not our church anyway. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what color you are, what side of the tracks you were born on. It doesn't matter what kind of job you got, what kind of education you have. Thank you. You notice how manly that microphone exchange was there? Josh did that with one hand tied behind his back. Yeah, let me tell you, God can save people. And you don't have to. You don't have to measure up to any kind of economic standard. There's no educational criteria for getting in this church. You can belong to this spiritual aristocracy. You don't have to have blue blood. You don't have to have been born in Hampton. You don't have to have been born on the rich side of town in a castle or a mansion. All you need is desire. I want to be saved. I want to make it. I want to be an overcomer. Hallelujah! Read Hebrews chapter 11. But now they desire a better country. They desire a better country. country. Listen to me, listen to me. The Holy Ghost is talking to somebody here. You're tired of this world. You're tired of the confusion. We've got women here tonight that are tired of being beat up by men. Tired of being abused. We got teenagers here that are on the fast track to nowhere. And you're tired of the riffraff. And you're tired of the merry-go-round. You say, you may be asking, how can I get out of the mess I'm in? Just say, God, I desire a better country. I seek a higher place. I seek a better life. I want to be filled with your spirit. Touch me with your grace. Touch me with, don't try to bring him anything. You can't buy this. Read. That is in heavenly. A heavenly place. Wherefore God is not ashamed. Now, you may think all heavenly places are yet to be. They're coming in the future. But no. Right here in this present world, through the Spirit and through this transformation, through this entrance into the body of Christ, this entrance into the spiritual aristocracy, you can actually sit in heavenly places in this present world. Now this way sometimes feels way too ordinary because we're all pretty ordinary in a lot of ways but when we begin to praise God and magnify God when we forget about who we are we begin to sing with all of our hearts and worship the Lord when we begin to just be real you know something begins to happen the presence of God fills this place and we go home and we say it was good it was good oh I could use a little help now tonight it was good to sit together in heavenly places. So Paul's saying here, there was just some people that desired. What did they desire? That is a better heaven. country. That is? And heavenly. A heavenly country. Wherefore? Wherefore God is not ashamed. Now here's where the dynamic comes in. I'm simplifying something more complex, but this will help you get it. All you have to do is to desire God. And when God 
sees that you desire Him. Now, if you truly desire Him, you will repent of your sins, you'll be baptized, you'll turn from this world. But it all starts with desire. And when you desire the Lord with your whole heart, I believe I can hear the Holy Ghost say, on the day that you seek Him with your have you ever told somebody that was seeking for the Holy Ghost? All you got to do is just seek the Lord with your whole heart. And when you begin to seek the Lord with your whole heart, you're going to find Him. So it's all about desire. Just desire. I want to be saved. I need God. I'm tired of this world. When that happens, wherefore, because of that desire. Is that right, Brother Josh? Yes. Anderson? Because of that desire. God is not because okay. God, because they just simply desired to get to a heavenly place. They were tired of this world. They wanted to live in the presence of God. Abide. Is this all right, preachers? Yeah. All right. Yeah. A little amen there. Okay. Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank God. This is not a place to sleep. Pay attention. Pay attention. If you boys go to sleep up here, it may send some kind of subconscious signal to the rest of the audience that it's all right to sleep. When you desire, when the folk desire to be saved, there is something, if I can say this, and I want to say this correctly, and there is something, I believe, that is transferred from God to you. When you begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness, God begins to say, i got to fill those folks. i got to help those folks. I've got to bless those folks. Clap your hands to the Lord now. Now look, I've been preaching hard for several days, and I want you to help me until I get finished. I don't want you to help me occasionally. I want you to help me till I get finished. Do you believe what I'm preaching is right? I'm telling you. I'm telling you, when you desire God, when you want God, when you hunger after God, when you get thirsty for God, God moves in your direction. Therefore, God is not ashamed. God is not ashamed to be called their God. To be called their God. Now, if you're half-hearted, the Book of Revelation spells it out this way: If you're lukewarm, God said, "I'll spew you out of my mouth." He hates lukewarmness. But if you have a desire, then God is not ashamed to be called your God. Now, here's the thing. The people that desire God and the people that want to be saved and the people that come and repent of their sins and are baptized in His name shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to make a prediction. Nothing can separate you. Once you get the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 35. Paul's now going to bring it home. It all started with the desire just to be saved, just to be together, just to walk together, just to be in God, just to be in His body, just to belong to the spiritual aristocracy, the family, the royal blood of Jesus Christ flows in our body. So Paul said what? Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? From the love of Christ? Who can do this? Shall tribulation? Is there enough power in tribulation to separate us from the love of Christ? Or now that isn't to say that the enemy will not put together a tribulation program with your name on it. He'll present the little tribulation plan into the hands of his demons and imps. And he'll say, go down there and give Pentecost a little tribulation. Give Barkas a little tribulation. Give O.T. a little tribulation. But I want you to know, there is no persecution. There is no tribulation that will ever have enough power to separate you. If you want to make it, you can make it. Died for us. Yes, read. Tribulation or distress or distress or persecution or, persecution. or famine. Somebody say, I don't think so. Famine or nakedness. That's when you don't have food. Nakedness when you can't afford clothes or peril or peril or sword. I believe Paul here is speaking literally. I believe he's saying even if it, it's more than just about famine, if you got down to pure deep nakedness, are you offended? If you just got down to where you didn't even have clothes to wear. I can't even imagine that kind of destitution, can you? So Paul is speaking here in the extreme. He said, if you got to the place where you had no ability to even buy clothes, not even that, has 
enough power to take away from you the joy that is in Jesus, the hope that is in Jesus, the life that is in Jesus. If you want to be saved, persecution can't take you away from Jesus. Trouble can't take you away from Jesus. Poverty cannot take you out of His hand. Read. As it is written, as it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Paul said, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. For the slaughter. Nay, and all these. It's things. not about what the world thinks about you. It's not what they thought about Jesus. Paul's saying this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's not about what the world thinks. It's not about the opinion of the world. God didn't wake up this morning and run an opinion poll to see if you were still popular enough for Him to be for. If God looked down on us today, extreme example, but if He looked down on us today and saw us completely persecuted, completely going through tribulation, in complete famine, and in complete nakedness, He would say, I still love them. I only let them go through this just to prove to them how strong I really am. Now, you may not have thought of this, but sometimes God lets you go through things so that you can understand how much you really love Him. You won't really know how much you love Him until you go through some trial, until you go through some persecution. Oh, I wish I had time to preach, but I have to go on here now. As it is written... For thy sake we are killed. For thy all sake day long. are we killed all the day long? We are counted as sheep. We're counted as sheep, ready for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things. But in all these things, we are more than in conquerors. all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through we're him. not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. I want to make a prediction. I want to make a million dollar statement here. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. If God's people want to make it, they can make it. If you need help, you've got help. If you need a touch, you've got a touch. If you need deliverance, deliverance will come. I wish you'd let me encourage you. Don't get so stubborn that you can't receive a little encouragement. I'm trying to pour a little cool water on you right now. God is going to take care of you. He's already made the promise. You desire Him. He's going to watch after you now. Here we go. Nay, in all these things we are more than, more conquered. than conquered. Through Him. Through Him. That loved us. That loved us. Now, we're not more than conquerors on our own strength. We're not more than conquerors on our own talents or abilities. We are more than conquerors through Him. See, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now, this is not referring to your passion. This isn't to say that you could ever be strong enough or big enough or bad enough that nothing could separate you. But if you desire, God has made a promise that if you desire Him, He, He will not allow you to be separated. See, that's the point. If the point is not that you will ever be big enough that no one could separate you, for we're all subject to temptation and we're all human. And we're all filled, filled with weakness and frailty and human error. But God says, Whitey baby, just be, where, where did White go? There he is. Macintosh baby. But I'm thinking of Whitey baby back here. It doesn't matter how strong you become. You can't get strong enough or good enough or holy enough or righteous enough to save yourself. But if you want to be saved and you're prepared to come and surrender all to Him and wake up every morning and say, Walk with me, Jesus. Talk with me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. If you're willing to think like that, then Jesus steps in and says, I'm not ashamed to be their God. I'm not ashamed to help them. And I'm not going to... Nothing will ever be powerful enough to separate them. Read on out here. For and they're going to be more than conquerors. Through Him that loved us. Yes, and Paul says now, verse 38, For I am persuaded. I am persuaded. That neither death. Let's just say it. I am per- Are you bored? You act bored tonight, I'm telling you. Are you bored? I am... Persuaded. Persuaded. I've come to this persuasion. What is it? 
That neither death. That neither what? Death. Death. Nor life. Death. Death. What if the devil came to you and said, "You're going to die next week"? He said, you, you you can't threaten me with death, because for me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. So get get away from me, demon of death, because I don't really care. I'm ready to meet the Lord. So death. Nor life, nor life, nor angels, nor angels, nor principalities, nor principalities, nor powers, nor powers, nor things present, nor things present, nor things, nor things to, come. to come, nor height, nor height, nor depth. Now, now what Paul's trying to do here, he's just covering all the bases. He's saying no height, no depth, no depth, nor any other creature, nor any other creature shall be able shall to be happen. able. None of these things will ever have the power to separate us. separate. Us from the love of God, from the love of God, which, which is, is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, our Lord. Clap your hands. <laughs> Clap them big time because nothing is impossible with God. Now, Isaiah chapter 54, what does it say? I love this verse. Everybody loves this verse. Isaiah 54, is it? And verse number 17. No weapon that is formed. Now watch this. No, I know we all preach this a lot, but it's just so good. No weapon that is, that formed, is formed against, against thee shall, shall prosper. prosper. And every, and every tongue that shall rise, that shall rise against thee judgment, in judgment thou, shalt, thou condemn. shalt condemn. This is the heritage. See, now you say, how's that going to work? It's going to work like this. Even when you stand in judgment. And I know we're using uh, uh, some theological language here to accommodate the human minds. It's not going to be exactly the way I say it, but just so that we can kind of figure it out. In judgment, however you envision it, if there is a charge made against you, you can say, that is true. I did used to do a little running around, but I put it all under the blood of Jesus Christ. And so even the devil's charges, even if he brings up the worst kind of stuff, you can say, I put it under the blood. Amen? Now you say, what about, half, what, about half, what about what happens to me after I get in the church? You better keep your account current even after you get in the church. For we have an advocate. If any man sin, we have an advocate. You need to go to Jesus Christ. Don't wait. You, know, get, you need to leave every Sunday night knowing that you're ready to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, you need to close out every day and be able to get down on your knees and say, God, I've fought a good fight this day and I've kept the faith. I've had a few little temptations. There's been some bumps in the road, but I still love you. I still desire to be saved. And I promise you, you will feel the love of God in your life. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper in every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the is heritage, the heritage of, the of, of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness. And their righteousness. Wow. It's not your righteousness, not even of you anyway. Your righteousness is not of your good works. As far as humanity is concerned, you're just vanity. But because you came to Him in your weariness... Perhaps in your sins, of course, and, and all of that. And you came to Him. You now say, my righteousness. In other words, my, my, uh, my, uh, my entrance fee has been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. How many love the Lord with all of your heart? Let's go now. One... This is the final verse I just want to read. Luke chapter, what is it, 10 and verse 19. Luke 10 and verse number 19, I think. Is that what I gave you? Luke 10 and verse number 19. Stand with me. You desire to be saved, I promise you. I want to make a flat out statement, a prophecy. The church cannot be taken out of the hands of Jesus Christ. I don't know about the future. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't understand all this stuff coming down. All of this gene manipulation and cloning and all of the scientific discoveries. I don't know what kind of people, what kind of society. The erosion of morals and all that. I don't know where we're going to end up. But I can say one thing emphatically. I could stake my whole life on it. I believe it with all of my heart. I am fully persuaded that whatever the future holds, God will keep the church in the midst of the storm. 
His true people, the true believers, those that love Him, those that desire to just escape this old world. God may look down and say, it's a mess down there. But Tim, do you still desire to be saved? And Tim says, yes, Lord. I'm tired, I'm weary, but I still desire to be saved. What about it, Brother Lloyd? You've had some hard things and you've been knocked around a bit, but you still desire to be saved. Oh, yes. God says, then I am not ashamed to be your God. Just on the basis of your desire. He's not ashamed to be your God. And He will walk with you. And we come now to this great verse in Luke chapter 10, I think, in verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. Behold, just as Jesus to His disciples, I, I believe really to the whole church. This is a tremendous symbolic. I, I, think you, I think it's literal, but it's also symbolic. It has, done, it has a meaning in every range of the human sphere. He says, I give you power. To tread, to tread on, on serpents and scorpions and, scorpions, and over all, and the, all power the power of the, of the enemy. And nothing, and nothing shall go slow and nothing shall, shall by any means hurt you. hurt you. Paul put it a different way. The great apostle, he said, I've, I've figured this out. Even things that are meant to be bad work together for your good. Because you have power in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to make a prophecy now for 2004. I want to prophesy. And I put my reputation on the line for what it's worth. I put my van, if you want it. Give you the title. Put everything there. There it is. You can have Sister Karen's million dollars. But I'll make a prophecy. If we want to be kept this year, when we get to the end of 2004, we'll still be in the church. I don't know what you're going to go through, but I'm going to make a prediction. Whatever you go through, persecution, trial, famine, setback, bankruptcy, heartache, sorrow, whatever. If you want to be saved, you'll still be right here in God's house at the end of 2004. I don't know what's going to happen in the world, but I'd like to make a prediction. When we get through any kind of test or trial, there'll still be a church. You read the newspapers and you say, Oh, look at that. They're coming against Christians and they're persecuting. No, no, there's going to always be a church. If we can just get young people to go to school and say, I desire to be a Christian, you might be surprised how much Holy Ghost can enter. See, I always I work on this one little premise. I, I, I know I'm being a little maybe tedious, but just let me finish. I, let me preach for me tonight for just a little bit. I work on this one premise. I know that if God really wanted to set this city on fire, the next time we have a funeral, and I'm not trying to be more, all we'd have to do is just have one body come up out of that casket. And the city of Indianapolis. Now, can God do that? See, I walk around every day believing that God could raise the dead. Now, I know He doesn't always raise the dead because God, sometimes He doesn't very often raise the dead because God takes us home to be with Him. But I always operate on this premise. Devil, you know, you may, get, you may get pretty wound up. You may get on our trail big time. But just one miracle set you back so many, put you back in the Stone Age. And don't think God cannot move miraculously. Remember how the New Testament church prayed? They prayed, Lord, let signs and wonders be named. Done in the name of that holy child, Jesus. Why? Just so that the oppressors and the persecutors will have to stand back and say, we don't understand this. Bow your head with me. Nothing, 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 nothing shall separate us. Nothing shall be able. See, nothing shall be able. Nothing will ever have the power to separate us. The apostle in Romans chapter 13, he said, look, it's great advice. Listen to me, young people. You need to be so disconnected from the world that you can follow the instruction of Apostle Paul who said, make no provision for your flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't even worry about this world because there's nothing in this world that can satisfy your soul. As we sing together, I wonder if there's somebody that would just say, I desire to be saved. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you've never repented it. The water is ready. We have people ready to baptize you tonight. 
I'd like to see about 10 or 15 people, 20 people get baptized tonight. Say, well, I don't know what it would take to be in that church. Just desire. You just want to be saved. Would you come right down here and just stand right in the front? Anybody here that just needs to repent of your sins or you need baptism or you need the Holy Ghost, I'm bidding you to come. And then there's other people here. Some of you good saints. Maybe you've been in the church 10, 15, 20 years. But you need to come tonight and you know in the Holy Ghost you need to come and just say one more time, God, I desire to be saved. I'm going through some stuff. But I desire to be saved. And if God's love, you feel a fresh touch of God's love on your life. Now let's fill this altar. Come up here. The prayer is your open. Make your way. If you need baptism, if you need the Holy Ghost, if you need, if you need to just touch Him one more time, why don't you come? Why don't you come? I don't care what the rest of the world is. Some of your ministers help me here. There's many people who need baptism, need the Holy Ghost. Let the Lord in Be encouraged, the Lord. I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I don't care what the rest of the world has to do. I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind. Ain't going to turn around. Yeah. Walking with the Jesus and I'm going to. You know why Jesus went to Calvary? Two reasons. First, he was persuaded that his dying would shed blood that was powerful enough to forgive the worst person. You ready? And then he was persuaded that death wasn't powerful enough to hold him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. You know why we got a church? And I'm persuaded I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is persuaded, why don't you get persuaded? Let's say it again. Ready? The three, the three greatest words in life. Thank you. It's not God is love. It's I am persuaded God loves me. It's not God is able to heal. It's I am persuaded God will heal me. Uh, we've had such moves of the Holy Ghost here. And yet somehow God has said to my heart, tell these people the greatest thing they'll get out of this whole conference is to walk out of here with an innate persuasion. So, uh, I got a word for you. Some of you got prayed for. Some of you got anointed. Some of you got spit all over. Somebody slapped you around and you didn't get your healing. The Lord told me to tell you, tell my people, sometimes my healing comes as a seed. And they want a full harvest. That's a miracle. But miracles are not always given to people. But healing comes as a seed. What does that mean? You better be persuaded the seed can be stolen. You better water it. You better protect it. You better nurture it. You better pray over it. You better bless it. You better encourage it. You better talk to it. You better be persuaded that the miracle is in the seed.